Well, good morning. I want to welcome you again to Cross Community Church. If you don't know me, my name is Jason Waymire. I'm the lead pastor here at Cross Community. We are starting week two of our Christmas series called the, the Cradle That Robbed the Grave. And we're looking at the coming of Jesus Christ and why that changed everything for us as believers in Him, and, and not just for us, but also for the entire world. And so last week I began telling you the big story of the Bible, the meta narrative of Scripture. If you want to know what the Bible is ultimately about, we began with creation, God creating a perfect world. Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the garden. They existed in perfect relationship with God and with each other, and with all of God's creation. It was beautiful. There was no sickness. There was no suffering. There was no pain. There was no death. But then there was act two, if you will, of the meta narrative. First was creation, and then came the fall. When Adam and Eve sinned against God and rebelled and went their their own way, all of creation became broken and marred and scarred. By sin, And it's true uh, of us. It was true of them. It's true for everyone and everything that's ever existed since Adam and Eve. We felt the weight of sin. We've known the sting of betrayal and hurt and difficulty in our lives. The good news is that God didn't stop there. God wasn't done. Uh, God was really just getting started. That after giving um, the law and the prophets and working among his people, choosing a people for himself, sending the judges and the kings and the prophets, God ultimately sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, for the third step, if you will, of the meta narrative of Scripture, and that is redemption. That God has come to redeem. And to restore us, to to restore the world uh, back to the way that it once was, to take away the sins of the world. And he did that through the person of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to take a look at three pictures that describe for us what Jesus did in his act of redemption. These are, I need to be honest with you, uh, my kids uh, make fun of me when my, my daughter talks about my preaching. She asks if I sit in my office and I just read big biblical words every day in order to have content for my sermons, and I do not do that. However, today, you're going to get three big biblical words, but these are three profoundly important words for us who have come to faith in Jesus Christ as believers in this world. These are words that changed everything for us. So if you have your Bible, Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. It's a scripture we actually referenced last week, but we're going to take a little closer look at this week. It's Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. Now, if you've been raised in church, you went to Sunday school, you've ever been trained in evangelism, uh, you know uh, Romans 3.23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In the meta narrative, step two, right? Creation and fall. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, it's true of us, it's why the world is broken, it's why we endure the suffering and hardship that we ultimately endure. But the good news is that God had a plan all along to redeem. And we see God working that plan, sending his son Jesus. Look in verse 24. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. The first big biblical word I want to talk to you about today is that of justification. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with this, you don't utilize this term in day-to-day speech. I get it. I don't either. Um, but it's a really important word for us to understand as men and women of faith and understanding the gospel. Uh, what I'm going to do with these three words, by the way, um, is paint a fuller picture of what Jesus did for us, what he did for us in redemption. None of these three words encompasses all of what Jesus did, um, but each of them is going to add more color, if you will, to the work of Jesus Christ. Now, this first word, justification, um, it means something really important for us. It means to be declared righteous. Now, I told you that as a result of the fall, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, so all of us are ultimately sinners before God. We've broken the law. If you've read much of Leviticus, 
You've broken the law not just a little, you've broken it a lot. I mean, if you've read the first five books of the Old Testament, you know that, oh my goodness, I have not kept this in any way, shape, form, or, or fashion. Like, I have broken the law. And, and if we didn't have all of the law of the Old Testament and we only had the Ten Commandments, we still sin grievously before the Lord. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this word, justification, it means to be declared righteous. And so we have to ask the question, as people who are, are thinkers and want to understand Scripture and, and not just believe things because uh, someone told us to, but rather to reason from the Word, uh, the question that we need to answer with justification is, how can a God who is perfectly just a God who is perfectly righteous, a God who is perfectly holy, how could he declare people righteous who aren't really righteous? If all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, how could you and I ever be justified or declared to be righteous? The law says with clarity that, that I'm guilty and that you're guilty and your sweet little granny's guilty, and anyone in your life who, who you think, man, she's a great lady or he's a great man, um, the law declares us guilty. So how can a perfectly just God, he's perfect in all of his ways, in his justice, how can he just overlook our sin and declare us righteous? You say, well, he didn't. But rather, God justified us in a different way. If you uh, have your Bible, jump up to verse 21. There's something really important that Paul is writing to the church at Rome about that he needs us to understand when it comes to being declared righteous by God. Um, we will never be declared righteous on the basis of the law. It will not happen. You can never be good enough. I can never be good enough before God. We've broken the law at even one point. We're guilty. We're lawbreakers. But in verse 21 of Romans chapter 3, Paul writes this. He said, but now, with the coming of Jesus Christ, with the advent of, of Jesus, this revelation that the Son has been born into this world and took on flesh, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And Paul's saying there's another righteousness out there that isn't you and I and how well do we keep the law. Did you do the things you're supposed to do and not do the things that you weren't? Um, there's a different sort of righteousness for us out there. A new righteousness has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. And what Paul's saying is they've been telling this, us this was coming the whole time. If you were reading in the Old Testament, there has been this anticipation of what God was ultimately going to do, that he was going to make us righteous in another way. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that a little later here today. In verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. And so today, if you're, you're here, you're going you're gonna to be here and you're going to stand before God at one point and you will either try to justify yourself on the basis of your works under the law or on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ and faith in what he's done. And so here's what it will look like. You'll, you'll stand before God and say, you know, uh, God, I was a pretty moral person. Tried to care for my neighbor. Tried to do most of the right things. I did fail at a few points, but, you know, I gave money to charity. I, I helped in some way, right? Like, I, I did some good things. And if that's your approach before God, to justify yourself before him, to show yourself righteous... You're going to fall far short. But there's another way to be declared righteous. And it's not based upon your own works. But rather it's based upon the work of Jesus Christ. This, this word justification, it gives us kind of the, an image of a courtroom, if you will. So imagine you're standing for the judge here. And as you stand before the judge, your, your mind flips back, as it often does, through the, the memories, kind of the camera roll of your life, and you think about the people that you've hurt, the things that you said, moments you aren't proud of. And you come before God, and you know there's this, hey, tell, tell me why you're, you're righteous, and 
And you just have to acknowledge that you're not. I haven't been righteous. I've said things, done things. I've acted in ways that I know are completely not righteous. They're sinful. But if you stand before God acknowledging your sin, but you have faith in Christ, because that's, that's what it talks about, right? Verse 24, we're justified by His grace as, as a gift. Ultimately, in verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Um, if we stand before God and, and we don't try to claim our righteousness, but we say, I have trusted in Jesus to save me. I've trusted in Jesus, not that I can be righteous enough, but here's what Jesus did. Jesus came to this earth and he took on flesh. He humbled himself and he became a servant. He endured the things that you and I endure in the flesh, weakness and temptation, struggles. He knew what it was to be abandoned and betrayed. He knew the difficulties of this life and yet Jesus Christ came and he kept the law perfectly. To a T, he didn't miss any single point. And then Jesus Christ offered himself up on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. So I've told you before about the great exchange that takes place when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. When we stop trusting in ourselves and our righteousness, but instead we trust in Jesus, what happens there is this exchange where Jesus takes all of our sin, the sins of your past, the sins of your present, and your sins in the future. And he bears those sins for you. And he takes that perfect, righteous life that he lived. And he credits that to your account. That is a gift given to us by faith. When we come and trust in Jesus and not in ourselves. Now, there's an interesting word there in 24. It says we are justified by his grace as a gift. Now, what grace is... Grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. Listen, we're guilty before God. We know it. The just punishment for our sin, it's death. It's separation from God in a place called hell. A place of weeping and, and gnashing of teeth and eternal torment. That's what we deserve. But what God gives us in His grace when we come to Him in faith is justification. He declares us righteous, not on the basis of our deeds, but on the basis of that perfect, sinless life that Jesus Christ lived for us. We receive that by faith. Now, faith is not merely believing that Jesus was a good prophet or an inspirational man. Faith is not coming to church. It's not praying a prayer. It's not walking an aisle. It's not getting wet in a baptistry. But rather, faith is trusting in Jesus to save us and to lead us and to teach us. It's making him Lord and King of our lives. And we demonstrate that to him by obeying, by loving him, by choosing to follow him. And so while faith is something very simple, we believe in our heart. And we confess with our mouths, we shall be saved. Faith is the beginning of a journey of following Jesus and surrendering our entire lives to him. And so the question I would ask you today is if you were to stand before God in this moment and he would ask you why he should let you into heaven, would you try to justify yourself based upon the law? I kept this. I didn't keep that. Or do you find yourself justified not by your own works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus came that we might be declared righteous by faith in him and faith alone. Now, the good news, um, Jesus is not like Santa Claus. You know, Santa Claus is making a list and he's checking it twice. He's trying to find out if you've been naughty or nice, right? Jesus knows that every one of us has been sinful. We've all been naughty, but it was a gift of his grace that he gives not on the basis of our merit, not on the basis of how well you're going to follow him, on how many people you'll lead to faith in him, or how pure a life that you'll live. Jesus has given us this gift of justification on the basis of his grace and the love with which he loves us. He saw us in our sin and chose to die that we might have life. Justification is a gift that we receive by faith. But that's only the first word. 
All right, so word number one, big biblical word, justification. There's another picture here that's really important. Read with me on in uh, 23 and then 24. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in, that is in Christ Jesus. The first word is justification, being declared righteous. The second word here is redemption. And whereas the first word gives us kind of this image of a courtroom and being declared righteous by the judge, even though we know we're ultimately guilty of sin, um, the, the second word is actually like a wartime word. Redemption gives us the image of someone who is a prisoner of war. Someone who's been captured, someone who's been defeated, someone who's been enslaved. And redemption is the price paid for their freedom. It's the ransom, if you will, the, the amount that's given. It's the thing that's exchanged in order for our freedom. You see, Jesus didn't merely justify us before God, just declare us righteous. He fulfilled the law that we couldn't fulfill. Um, Jesus went further. He also redeemed us. If you would have lived during the biblical times, you would have seen this played out over and over and over. And praise God, we don't live in a world that's uh, crushed by slavery uh, any, any longer, at least not in our nation but it was a fairly common practice for someone to find themselves indebted. They lived, um, it wasn't paycheck to paycheck, it was day by day. Uh, you would make enough that day to go buy food to feed your family and you would be broke again. And so when anything came up, there were you know, expenses that weren't planned, something uh, went on, you would find yourself indebted. And when you couldn't pay your debts, um, you would be sold into slavery until such a time as you'd worked off those debts. And so you were what's known as a bond slave, enslaved until your bond had been paid. And it might take years. It might take your entire life. But you would work until that was paid. The problem with, with you and me and the, this picture that Paul is painting for us of the work that Jesus did is that our debt is so great that we can't pay it. We've sinned, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. The wage of that sin is death. So God and His Son, Jesus, He sent His one and only Son who took on flesh. And Jesus came and He lived that perfect, sinless life. He was betrayed by one of His closest friends. He was falsely accused and arrested by the chief priests and the Pharisees, kind of the leading religious rulers of his day. At that point, all of the disciples, they deserted him. In the house of the high priest, he was beaten. He was mocked. He was spat upon. They placed a cloak over his head and would take turns hitting him. If you're a prophet... Why don't you prophesy and told us who just hit you? He ripped out his beard. They handed him over to Pilate. He was kind of the Roman ruler in place at the time. He placed a purple robe on his body, a crown of thorns on his head. After examining him, Pilate found no reason to, to punish him. And yet the crowd cried out, crucify him. Crucify him. So Pilate handed them over to be, to be beaten. He was flogged. They would have bound his, his arms around a post to stretch out his back taut where he couldn't even recoil from the beating he was going to receive. They would use what's known as a cat of nine tails. It was a, a whip with leather straps, and in those straps would have been um, embedded shards of bone and bits of glass such that um, when the Roman soldier would whip him, those bits of bone and shards of glass would embed in his body, and when they would pull the whip back, it would literally tear his flesh in strips. Lash after lash after lash. Brutal form of punishment. And after beating him to the point they would have been close to death, they took that heavy, rough-hewn timber, 
the cross member of the cross, and they placed it on those shoulders that had been torn apart by the beating he'd endured. The scriptures tell us that he was beyond recognition and began to make, make his way toward Golgotha. Maybe it was dehydration or the loss of blood or some combination of both, but he couldn't even make it all the way there. They had to find a man to carry that cross member for him. And when they found themselves at Golgotha, they stretched him out there. And they drove nails through his wrists and through his ankles. They attached that cross member to the vertical beam and they would have stood the cross up and it would have slid into place with a jolt. The cross was the most brutal form of Roman execution. With your arms stretched out, your diaphragm was extended you wouldn't have been able to take a breath without first pressing yourself up, supporting your entire body weight on those nails driven through your ankles. And Jesus would gasp in a breath only to fall back with a weight now on his wrists. Agonizing form of death. Minute after minute, comment after comment. They're mocking him at the foot of the cross. The sign read, King of the Jews. They cast lots for his clothes. If he's the Son of God, why doesn't he come down from the cross? Why doesn't he save himself if he's going to be the Savior of others? There on the cross, Jesus died the death that we deserved. Jesus died paid the debt that we couldn't pay. Jesus was enduring the punishment that should have been ours. He was paying that price to redeem us from our slavery to sin and ultimately our punishment that was declared upon us, that punishment of death. And Jesus did it for us. Whereas in justification... Jesus kept the law that we couldn't keep. In redemption, Jesus paid the price that we couldn't pay. The wages of sin was death. Jesus Christ endured that for us. I'll say specifically, Jesus endured that for you. So we have justification and we have redemption. But Paul is still not done. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Again, you probably don't use propitiation uh, in your day-to-day -day conversation, but if you were a good Jew, you would have understood it very well. Leviticus chapter 16 it prescribes what's what we commonly know as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement for the Jewish people. That once a year, the high priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies within the tabernacle or the temple, the most holy place um, before the presence of God. And there he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat to make atonement for the sins of the people. And so before the priest went in, they would have found two different goats. They would have been pure, spotless males. And these goats were to serve a very specific purpose for the nation of Israel. The first goat there at the entrance to the tent of meeting, they would have slaughtered the goat. And everyone would have been watching, all of the nation of Israel, and they would have known that that goat had to die for their sins. They would watch as his blood would shed, as his life was snuffed out. And the priest, after consecrating himself and offering sacrifices for his own sin with the blood of that goat, would go into the Holy of Holies behind the veil and there on what's known as the mercy seat. He would sprinkle that blood to make atonement for the sins of the people. Year after year after year, they would see this going on. And the trouble was is they would sin again. And so something else had to die year after year after year. But it wasn't just that one goat. Um, there was another. Uh, there was another goat there that at the entrance of the tent of meeting, the high priest, he would take and he would place its hands on the head of that goat and he would confess the sins of the people. 
he would confess the sin of pride. Sin of anger. Of bitterness. Unforgiveness. Arrogance. Rebellion. Addiction. Idolatry. Of lying. Stealing. Committing adultery. Of lust. Sin after sin after sin. With his hands placed on the head of that goat, it was a symbol that he was transferring the sins of the people. And that goat wasn't to, to be sacrificed there within the, the tent. It wasn't to be offered there on the altar. But rather that goat was to be taken outside of the camp into the wilderness. And it was to be set free where it would never be seen again. So two pictures in two goats. One symbolizing the blood that had to be shed in order to atone for the sins of the people that the wrath of God might be satisfied or appeased for just a year, right? Because God is perfectly holy and we're completely sinful. We've been separated from God due to our sin. There's this distance between us because light can't have fellowship with darkness. We couldn't have a relationship with God except in the event that our sins could be atoned for. And the wrath of God could be satisfied. So this picture, when Paul uses this word of propitiation, the the good Jewish people would have understood exactly what he meant. It meant to appease the wrath of God and to take away the sins of the people. So when, when Paul says, that's what Jesus did, when he says that the law was pointing forward to Jesus, he's saying, he's the Lamb of Atonement. And he's the scapegoat. He's the one that came to take away the sins of the world. As Jesus hung there on the cross. And his blood was shed. This great exchange happened. Jesus cried out. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? And there on the cross, Jesus endured the wrath of God against sin. The wrath of God was satisfied by his blood sacrifice. And there on the cross, Jesus took our sin. Your sin of yesterday, your sin of today, your sin of the future. And he bore that sin. He took it away from you. Such that when God looks at those of us who have come to faith in Him, when God looks at us, He doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see our our shame or our guilt. Jesus has made the atonement for that. Jesus has been our propitiation. He took that sin away. What happened when Jesus took our sin is that wall of sin that separated us from God was torn down. That we might now enjoy a relationship with our Creator. No longer being afraid of God, no longer deserving of His wrath, but rather now being adopted as a son. When God sees you, not only does He not see your sin, He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. God's not waiting on you to get your act together. He's not waiting on you to clean yourself up or somehow do enough good works that you're now acceptable to Him. Your sin has been taken away. The righteousness of Jesus has been credited to you. And so the invitation is to begin enjoying a relationship with your Creator. Jesus Christ came, God in the flesh, to be our justification. To fulfill the law that we couldn't keep. To be our redemption, to pay the price that we couldn't pay. And to be our propitiation, to endure the wrath that we deserved. And He did it because He loves us. And He wants us to enjoy a relationship with Him. Now, there are just three ways that we can respond today. The first is this. If you're here today and you've never come to trust in Jesus Christ, you've never placed your faith in Him, your response today is to cry out to Jesus to save you from your sin and to begin a life of following Him, no longer going your own way or or doing what seems right to you, but instead following Jesus and doing what's right uh, before Him, looking into the Word, right? You unite yourself with His church. You begin to follow Him. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the second way is we we walk with Jesus in faith. 
through whatever circumstances that God allows into our path, whatever we might face in this world. Maybe you just need to be reminded of the love of God for you. That Jesus suffered and he bled and he died for you. And the cross is this eternal testimony of God's love for you in your life. And maybe you feel like no one else has ever loved you. Everyone else abandoned you. Jesus says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Maybe today you need to lay down your guilt and your shame. And you've been carrying around your past, the burden of your sin for far too long. And today you need to entrust that to Jesus. And you don't pick it back up again. You realize that when God looks at you, you've been declared righteous. He sees the sinless perfection of Jesus. And you run to him in a relationship, calling him your father. And he loves you as a son and a daughter. And maybe for you, it's time to start growing as a disciple, following him with your life. Maybe you have walked an aisle and prayed a prayer. Maybe you have come to faith in Jesus, but you've never matured in him. You've never found the new life where you're walking with God and enjoying that day-to-day relationship with him. Jesus came a baby in a manger. And he was victorious over the grave. He set us free from the law of sin and of death. He justified us. He redeemed us. He is our propitiation. So would you receive him in faith today? Would you bow? Father, we thank you for your work on our behalf. We're thankful for the gospel, that that these three words paint the picture more fully of the work that you did and why it's good news that you came. Father, I pray that we as your people would be the most grateful people in the world. Because we're reminded that you kept a law that we couldn't keep. That you endured the punishment that we deserve. God, that you bore the wrath that we couldn't bear. You've taken our sins away. We've been declared righteous, not because we deserved it, but because of your own goodness and grace. Father, may you transform our hearts. For those who are in this room that don't know you, God, maybe they've been clinging to their sin. Maybe they don't believe that they're worth saving. Maybe they think that they've sinned too much. They've gone too far. And God, the cross is a picture. It says you're willing to go even further in order to pursue them and to save them. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. God, for those who have been walking through this life unsure of your love, unsure of whether they can trust you, who have been hurt and betrayed and abandoned. And God, they're just not sure they can trust anyone else today. I pray that you might fill their heart with faith that they can trust in you. May they receive your love and your grace, your mercy in their lives. May they begin a relationship with you. God, for those of us in this room who, who over time, we get distracted, the busyness and the things of this world, and we lose sight of what our great God has done for us. We lose sight of the sacrifice that you made for us. God, I pray today that we might be reminded anew of your work. Our hearts may be stirred again with the love that you exhibited for us. God, I pray that we move forward as your disciples, your church, your ambassadors while we're here. God, would you use us for your glory? pray that today would be a day of obedience. So have your way in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand.